This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Carl Tatz Design, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, and Isotope. You're hearing my voice right now through the Jay-Z pop filter on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone in a Carl Tatz designed room through the Spectra 1964 STX-600 mic pre complimenter and Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G SSD. So get ready to rock. When you're doing mix revisions, it's super important to go in and make sure you save as is the next thing so that you're not undoing the first mix. Because quite often they say, oh, I really like that first mix. But I, you know, when I opened it to do the revision, I didn't save it as, as mix two. And then I can't, I don't remember what it was or how it was and even how to get back to it. And then you look like a, an idiot because you don't know how to keep your shit organized. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. I used to have an expensive pop filter for my vocal mic that was so fragile, I had to put a sign on it warning singers not to touch it or else the thing would break, but not anymore. Now I've got this super durable pop filter from jayzmic.com that sounds fantastic. I don't have to worry about stuff breaking and can focus on making music. Go ahead, grab my pop filter. I dare you. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS and get 20% off the amazing pop filter at jayzmic.com. Howdy, Rockstar. Are you ready to discover the secrets to making your mixes sound professional no matter what your studio situation? Then check out my free mixing course, MixMasterBundle.com, where I show you how to get pro-sounding mixes in your DAW using simple techniques and free plugins. And when you're ready for more advanced studio skills, then check out Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can learn from Grammy-winning teachers to help you record, edit, mix, and master your best record ever. Use the code ROCKSTAR for 10% off for a limited time. No matter where you like to rock in the galaxy, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron lets you record with confidence over USB-C with up to more than a gigabyte per second of real-world performance. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Find the Envoy Pro Electron and all your OWC storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jay Took, an award-winning Canadian-born producer, songwriter, and musician who moved to Nashville in 2012. Having gotten his start as a working musician at the age of 17, some of his earliest memories are of plunking out melodies by ear on the family's piano, but it was the intro to Dire Straits' Money for Nothing that lit a fire in his soul for the drums. Not long after he started a love affair with the guitar also, and from then on, his sights were set on a career in music. During his 26-year career, he's toured all over the world with a range of artists from Canada and the U.S. and has produced records that have garnered critical and commercial success in Australia, New Zealand, Germany, as well as Canada and the U.S., His philosophy behind making records has always been about helping the artists find their own voice in the studio. It's never about forcing ideas or making the record he wants to make. It's a collaboration between producer and artist to find the truest form of the song, allowing the material to become the best version of itself through exploration and experimentation. Thanks so much to Bobby Holland at Pentaveret Studios, Pentaveret I'm going to say that well. Pentaveret <laughs> Studios for making our introduction. Thanks, Bobby. Please welcome Jay Took to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jay, are you ready to rock, dude? I I am. Dude, you know what? Listening to your discography, you definitely bring the rock, man. Um, <laughs> you, there, there's a consistent strength to the, to the tracks in your discography. And I'm guessing that you've pretty much everything that we've got in our Spotify is, is you playing drums. 
Yeah. Yeah. Most of it. Um, there's a couple things on there. There's the Zerbin record that I engineered that I didn't play drums. I just, uh, I, I came into the back half of that record and, and engineered the guitars and vocals and piano and some weird things, but yeah, pretty much everything that you see is me on drums. That's good. Cause one of my questions is about the Zerbin record too. So <laughs> well, you get to talk about something you didn't play drums on. There we go. Um, let us know a little bit more in your own words, you know, who you are and, um, you know, how you got, Give us a brief version of getting interested in music and, and ending up in Nashville, of all places, at Pentaveret Studios. And tell us about Pentaveret as well. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, you said in the introduction there, uh, I grew up in a really small town in in Canada called Weyburn, Saskatchewan, which is, uh, I grew up about, I think it's probably two hours straight north of Bismarck, North Dakota, and I'm just an hour over the border. Um, and, you know, it's typical thing that you hear in a lot of country songs about you know wanting to get get out of there and and get to the big city but i i got my music start when i was you know real young and just you know we had a piano in the house and and there was always something around to make some noises on and then um once i i started playing and and it, the i mean the bug hit me real quick i mean the first time i was on stage was fourth grade for some you know uh christmas uh, program or something like that. And I was playing mm -hmm. the, uh, the Omni chord. Nice, that was, man. <laughs> that was the first instrument I played on stage. And Santa uh, actually made a cameo because he's only, li he lives in the next town over. Yeah. He's a couple hours North. He's, he's not far away at all. Right, so. right. Yeah. Um, but you know, I remember that vividly. I mean, that was that, that's kind of where the bug got me. And then, you know, once I started listening to the radio and kind of digging through my mom's record collection and, and really getting into music and, um, uh, and started finding people, you know, when I was 12 or 13 that I could sit, you know, sit down and play music with, um, you know, finding that kid that lives across the street that has a guitar and you can both sort of kind of play the same ACDC riff. And then you do that for about an hour and a half and it's the greatest day of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, for recording, I'd always, one, you know, I, I would read. I was big on reading liner notes and wanted to know what a producer did and how what the engineer did and what all these words meant. And then I started reading about it a lot because you, you know, back then you could, you had to really dig for things. But um, I got really into reading anything that Mutt Lang talked about because I was oh, huge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, ACDC and Def Leppard for me when I was growing up were were just paramount. I mean, they were my favorite things, and and I wanted to learn how to do that. And I think I was about 15 or 16 when I bought my first four track. It was a, a, a Tascam 426, if I remember correctly. And it had no manual. And, you know, this is nine, you know, early 90s and no Google or anything. So I had to figure it out on my own, like what, you know, what all these buttons and switches and stuff meant. And once I figured out how to get sound onto the tape, then I was off to the races. Um, yeah. So what, put, you were starting with a four track or something like that? Yeah. And, I, I just would sit in my room and, and I, I'd save up and buy the cheapest $20 mics I could from Radio Shack and just kind of put them around my drum kit in my room and play along the records and record that and figure that out. But once I got that in there and I, I all it was it was like as soon as I figured out how to use that machine, every question that I ever had seemed to be answered about how you record music and how you do it. And that started the journey for me. And then... In 97, when I was 19, I moved to Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is a city about the size of Nashville that's six hours east of where I grew up. And it's a bigger city with a really incredible music scene. And that's where I really started to cut my teeth and work in studios and work with, you know, real musicians and people that were making a living at doing this. And, and, uh, and then from there, you know, I started touring with people. I was interning at different studios and then had my own spot that I worked out of and produced some records out of that. And then, you know, in 2012, um, they just opened up that I'd been wanting, I'd thought about Nashville for a while and I just said, screw it. And I packed up my shit and came here. So was <laughs> there, was there like a real, um, a push or was there a sort of a, uh, magnetic pull for Canadian, you know, a certain segment of music making in Canada to, to come to Nashville. Did it, just, was there, was it the connection of country music? Was it, I mean, you know, cause like Roy Thomas Baker and Mutt Lang, you might've wanted to move to London, for example, to go make records. Well, the thing is, is 
you know, through at that time, like I had, I didn't really know much about modern country music. I mean, I, I toured with a band in Canada called Doc Walker and the first tour that I ever did with them, they were co-headlining for, uh, Dirks Bentley. And I hadn't, you know, it was, I did like, I didn't know who Dirks was cause I was a big rock kind of fusion guy. And, and, and I, you know, I didn't listen to country radio and you, you were still watching Dave Vec- uh, Weckl videos back then. Yeah, Dave Weckl and Carter Beaufort and, you know, all the notes. I had a giant drum kit and, you know, 15 Chinas and 12 splashes and all that kind of... <laughs> did, you have, did you have the gong behind you? I never did. They're too expensive. Uh, our drummer had the gong. He had the gong and the wind chimes over the Ooh. gong. See, that's that's a pro right there. That's that's a pro move, having yeah. the wind chimes and the gong. It all, it never left his basement, but it was there for rehearsals. <laughs> so it was pretty fun. <laughs> well, and so... I, I started listening to more country and I got really into uh, Keith Urban and uh, I really love the way that sonically, the way those records sounded. I, you know, uh, Justin Niebank engineered all that stuff and I was just enamored with how those records sounded because they were so smooth, but there was still an openness to them. And so I started to think about coming down to Nashville and then it was, it was really the draw was just this challenge for me. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to be a busy session guy. I wanted to, uh, write hit songs and I wanted to produce and mix hit records and, 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 you know, arrogant, very arrogantly moved to town thinking that I was going to come in and just be hot shit of King mountain here or King (laughs) mountain, whatever it is, but (laughs) you know, and quickly learned that, you know, how this town works and, and, and how things are. But the biggest draw to Nashville for me was just a challenge to myself. Like, can I go down there and can I do this? And can I hang with these should I ever get the opportunity to work with these people that I, I've spent all this time listening to their, their records and, and, uh, you know, can I, can I come down and can I do it? Can I make a living and not go home after a year with my tail between my legs? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's a kind of a contrast to how I arrived here because I just came down because it was a school for recording and I thought recording sounded like fun and I'd enjoyed playing music, but I was clueless about Nashville didn't know any of the records or producers or musicians that were coming from here. I didn't even know Nashville was considered a music city <laughs> at the time <laughs> I moved here. I just was like, I don't know, school for recording sounds fun, you know? Yeah. And so it's cool to hear you like be really determined about it. What were um, what was your experience when you landed here, and, and what were some of the first opportunities that um, made real sense to you? Well, the... Uh probably the biggest thing, like I, I got here and, and, uh, I, <laughs> as soon as I got here, I got a gig with a Canadian artist, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, a woman named Michelle Wright, who had a deal. I think she was with, uh, Arista records back in the nineties. And then she had one, a uh, couple of big singles in the States. And then she ended up, you know, uh, getting dropped from her label and then went on to have this massive career in Canada. Um, and I played for her for a little while and that, able that opened up a few doors and that I got to meet some some players that were um you know doing a little bit more than than I had ever done and and um and then I just I hustled as much as I could like I was you know on Craigslist and and all of these places just like drummer needed like if and if anybody needed anything I mean I was I was lighting them up and working for just about nothing and trying to get in front of as many people as I can and then the first session that I did here uh was at a place on the east side called East Side Manor and uh oh, yeah, Todd's had, place. Yeah, over at Todd's place. So I I had met them through uh, a guy that would turn out to be my roommate for a while. And he was producing a record for this girl and the drummer came in and and you know they they did the full Nashville session and but the drummer just wasn't cutting it and and I was just on him like, you know, he says, I don't know what we're gonna do. And I said, dude, I will replay the entire record for free. I just want to be in a studio and be a part of something and doing that nice you know and that was my first real uh session where you know i got handed a proper number chart and you know we ended up recutting a few with the full band and i had to sit there and pretend like i knew what i was talking about i get handed these hieroglyphics with numbers on them and Uh (laughs) you know and trying to and just like oh yeah i got this no problem so i was sitting there like you know, it was like in math class, I was copying off the guitar player beside me. He's making notes and I go, oh, okay, that's what this is. Yeah. Oh, and then I you were like, wait a minute, each one of these numbers is just a bar. Oh shit. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. Exa- yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was decoding all of those, all of those things. And, um, you know, I just, 
I just went in like I do with the way I handle a lot of things. I just, if I don't know, I'm, I'm going to figure it out because I know I have the skill set to do it, but um, I'm either going to fall on my face or, or it's going to work out. And I've fallen on my face several times <laughs> with that sort of thing, but I always come away learning something and, and better for it. So tell us what a natural numbers chart is. Give us, give us the basic introduction to it and um, maybe explain how it's something that could be helpful for a band playing together for the first time in the studio. What it's, it's a really simplistic way. Whoever I invented it is, is a genius because it takes, you know, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, da, all the seven notes of the major scale, and it assigns a number to each one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they're written in a way where uh, you can put an entire song on one piece of paper. And, you know, uh, you have an idea of how many bars are there and 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 what's there and it, it just keeps everybody on the same page and as long as all the musicians you know know their theory well enough that they can they can sit and sight read that down and follow it down everybody has a pretty clear roadmap of what's going on and it uh it's it's really an ingenious thing and it i know it aggravates a lot of uh like classically trained musicians uh because it's they they, they see it they don't see it as something that's a, a valid uh uh, form of music uh, as far as being able to sit down and play. But it, it's nice because it, it it forces everybody to have their own creativity. And, right, right. You know, you, and you basically just have this, this uh, um, roadmap for the song. And, you know, with all the players in this town and, 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 and as many of these things as I've been on, I'm still constantly amazed by the way that everybody can just come together very quickly and just make stuff happen super, super fast. And, uh, it, but it's, it's definitely, it definitely makes working quickly. If that's your goal, uh, very, very easy and, uh, and makes it, it also gives everybody a really easy way to communicate about sections of the song yeah. too, which is great. Yeah. That's sort of my take on it too. Is it, when you talk about classical musicians, it's not like, you know, if you sit down at the piano and you can read piano music, you can start playing out the whole song sort of you know pretty much yeah but it but with a chart it's it doesn't tell you how to play the songs exactly but it does tell you what the arrangement is and like you said it makes it really easy to communicate between everybody because you now you can just say instead of like you like we used to do when we talked about music when we were in our first bands you're like you know after the third chorus part where afterwards where you know you say billy and then you go dun, 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 dun. yeah 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 you know, now you can just say like oh in the 6 you know 6 4 turnaround or whatever it is uh yeah you know, after bar, the, bar 9 of bar 9 of the chorus on the split 2 2 3 uh walk up can i get the can you punch me in on beat 3 of that bar please or whatever it is you know like it's 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 very easy. It's it's a very simple roadmap. Yeah, and then everybody knows exactly what you meant. You you only have to do it once instead of five times. Yeah. Well, very cool. Where are the places where um, charts um, sometimes fall apart, where it's not going to do the trick for it for you? Uh, metal bands. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> what about art, art rock? Yeah, I mean anything where. I mean, but even then it's, it's useful, you know, I mean, I've worked with artists where, you know, we do this kind of art Rocky thing and it's, it's still just the easiest roadmap to just sit down and write a number chart, you know, I mean, and, and the more diverse the music gets, or, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do something in a, in a Radiohead style vein, you know, if you've got, you know, you bring a, a guitar player in, like, say you're not doing the, the band sitting in a room and I, you know, I'll get, bass and drums down and then bring a guitar player and he's still got to have an idea of what he's looking at. And then from there you can, uh, you can do it. But the only time that it, you know, that big riffy rock things, I think, and, you know, like I said, metal bands, I had a metal band in here over the weekend, like an old school thrash metal band. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my Nashville learned studio tricks, uh, as far as like how to keep track of everything, like I, using that sort of mindset didn't serve me as well as, um, it could have, and I had to, my approach to running the session for that day was, was a lot different than, you know, if I'd had a band in here, uh, reading charts and cutting demos or cutting a, you know, whatever it might be. So you're just focused on how to play the double kick as fast as possible. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. This, this band, this drummer, they're kids. They had, uh, uh, the bass player is 14. 
the guitar player was 16 and the drummer just turned 17 and the, the drummer like he looked like he, he was a, a, a an extra in the in the show freaks and geeks <laughs> just you know he's about five foot six and he's real frail and 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 he you know i don't know that he's um and just well not frail but just he's just he's just a small timid looking kid and he gets on the drums and it's like okay this one's a 205 and it's just like destroying it it was That's terrifying awesome. yeah it was Sounds great. like a, a force to be reckoned with mm-hmm. you know a band of kids of that age is is I mean, that's where rock and roll comes from. It was inspiring. I love that stuff. Do you need to record direct stereo keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound high Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad. The Spectra 1964 BBDI Passive Direct Box is also perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter, and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your pant leg. Get your sound moving at spectra1964.com. With so many game-changing Isotope plugins to choose from, deciding which one to buy next could be a bit of a challenge. But did you know that now you can have all their plugins through Isotope's new affordable subscription bundle, Music Production Suite Pro, for only $19.99 per month? Get your Rockstar extended 30-day free trial subscription now at isotope.com rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Um, okay, very cool. So uh, let's see. Let's let's keep jumping forward here. Tell us about your studio. You're at Pentaveret Studios. Um, I think did you take over one of the existing rooms there? And um, you know what? Are you in the studio now? And and, and if so, what are you surrounded by? Uh, I am in the studio right now. I uh, yeah, I moved in here last year. I uh, I took over Studio B, um, which if any of you have ever been over here, is the room off the live room. Um, was that was that Will's room for a while? Yeah, I took over Will's room. So, um right now I am I am surrounded by a Trident Trimix uh I think it's a 70 Trimix 70 console which I really really love that came with the room um which was a very nice addition. Um I'd never really worked much with with Trident anything before and uh I am very I very very quickly fell in love with this desk. It it has um it has a very specific tonality to it, the same way that when you plug into an old Neve desk, there's there's a there's like a common thread of of tone that kind of happens on anything that's recorded on one of those. Um, and I'm finding that with this with this Trident desk, it's it is an absolute m- magician with a drum kit. It's that's, unbelievable. That's awesome. And Rockstars, I was referring to Will Pugh, which who's been on the podcast episode 97 way back we did it we did an interview out of um, pentaveret and it was a different room in fact too oh yeah uh and then you know just a lot of the usual accoutrement um a couple of neve pre's i've got some distressors 1176s you know that usual thing i'm uh, i'm running uh some pmc monitors as well as some atomics which is uh is a very great combination for for mixing they're uh they're they're very good complement to each other, which which I like. And yeah, you have the Atomic Six Tens, I think, right? Yeah, those yeah. are those are incredible sounding speakers. Um, t- I, talk a little bit more about that. I mean, what is it that makes PMCs and Atomics work well for you mi- for mixing? What call what mixing calls do you make on each of those speakers when you're listening to them? The PMCs for me are about clarity. Um, they're they're some of they're probably the most detailed monitors I've ever listened to. Um, I'm I'm using the Result Six, which is their you know kind of entry level thing, but they are by no means entry level. Um, and generally, I I really try to I use those to kind of within my mixes everything kind of above you know 200. I'm really fine tuning on those, and then I switch over to the Atomics uh, because they have the sub built into the back of them, and I really fine tune the low end that way and. Um, they are, they couldn't be more different sounding speakers. Uh, but the way that, the way that I find, I, I find that my mid range is right when I can switch back and forth and things don't drop out of the mix and, and kind of get buried in there. Interesting. Uh, 
it's a really it's a really strange thing and it took me quite a while. I actually didn't like the atomics for probably the first 3 4 months that I was in here because I I didn't quite understand them and then once I figured out that um I can use them for more than just dial, you know, getting the the low end feeling right in my mixes. Um there's there's just a point where you switch back and forth between the two of them and if everything stays level and even I know that it's time to print. That's cool. Um you know, when I listen to the atomics I was really blown away by the sound. They 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 are very com- um I guess complimentary is that the word? You know, they mm-hmm. they make music sound great when you listen to them and reminded me of the feeling that I had listening to like old school vintage stereos. Yeah, yeah. You know, where things are really appealing sounding, but I haven't worked on them so I don't know if there were challenges, you know, like you I, you described. I I just I love them. I and I think it's cuz I had to learn how to listen to them because the way that they they sound great but you have to i had to really figure out what what was right and what was wrong and 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 what i was realizing because i was going back and listening to old mixes of mine that didn't sound good on them and i was like well these are terrible because clearly my mixes are the best thing ever and and you know just this sort of like cocky <laughs> thing about it you know cuz i was before i moved in here i had a i had had a set of events that i was mixing on for a while and very quickly realized um what uh how a lot of that stuff was lacking and 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 just how not good my mixes were until i got into this into this room and started yeah. working on these monitors and then you know my mastering engineer i use uh nathan dantzler is a good friend of mine and and uh, over at the hit lab and he masters 98 percent of the things that i work on and and the first mix i sent him out of here uh he called me and he's like what are you doing different and I said, well, I bought those PMCs and uh, these Atomics. And he's like, yeah, this is great. Don't ever change. <laughs> nice, man. That's yeah. cool. That's a good thing to hear from somebody. Yeah. I'm looking forward. I hope I get to I get that reply from my mastering engineer at some point. Do you? Do, <laughs> I always, every time I send something, I just, I hit send. And then I know when he's going to open it and I wait. And I just kind of hope that he's going to call me and go, yeah, this sounds really badass. I'm like, awesome. That's great. This sounds really bad. Ass. <laughs> bad comma ass yeah. yeah all right so you're in studio b which is like you said it's kind of just off the live room at pentaveret you can turn to your right i believe and look through the glass and see a complete room with drum kit and everything iso booths is that correct yes yes it is and then pentaveret is a really cool place so maybe t- describe that because um you know what a what a wonderful thing you guys are creating over there yeah it's it's really the perfect place, and I'm 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 very fortunate that I ended up here. Um, Pentaveret is a it's a five room facility, so there's my room and then Bobby's room that are both uh, connected and patched into the live room, and then we have three satellite mix overdub rooms that all have their own vocal booths and 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 you know just kind of smaller overdub working areas, and it's a really great community of like minded people. Um, we are a tracking studio and we do do tracking days here, but the, you know, our, our big thing that we, we strive for is that, you know, there's six produ- seven producers working out of this place. There's a couple of shared rooms, but, um, we're all just using the space to make our own records and it, and we all work together as a, as a community and, and play on each other's things. And, and it's, it's really fantastic because everybody here is so extremely talented and good at what they do. Um, you know, you've talked to Bobby and you know, Bobby, I mean, he's, he's one of the best engineers that I've ever worked with ever in my life. And, and, you know, he pushes me and, and makes me want to work harder and be better at what I do. And, and same with everybody else that's in here. And we're all working on different types of music primarily all the time. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's a nice, it's a nice melting pot or, or stew, if you will, when we all get to work together on projects, because we all come from pretty diverse backgrounds musically. And it it's, we've found that, you know, it's, it makes for a really interesting sound. There's a magic that happens, you know, not all the time. A lot of times we swing and we miss, but when it's right and we're all playing together on something or just, you know, working, uh, in tandem on different things, it's, uh, you know, some of the best music that I've, I've, I've just, I'm making and doing the best work that I've ever done in this building. And I, and I credit, I credit a lot of that to the people that are in this building. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, there's the um the even just the idea of having a shared kitchen and eating space. It's it's very like old school studio that I've heard so many um you know, 
veteran producers, uh, you know, just just talk about you know how they how much they miss that. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 a thing that happens when everybody takes their lunch break or you go out to get a cup of coffee and you know um, Adam uh, Bokish that works here his room is off the off the kitchen and he'll pop out and oh hey dude yeah what are you doing cool we'll we'll listen to stuff and I'll go in and check out what he's doing and he'll come over and 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 we'll talk about ideas and and uh, it, it's a very open sort of thing there's 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 really no ego um, we're all just committed to being good to each other and, and, and supportive to everybody. And we talk freely and openly about ideas all the time. And that for creating art, it's really the best situation. It's, I, I really couldn't be happier with, with where I'm at right now. That's great. Um, I'm Adam has been a guest on the show too. He's talking about creating a lot of synth music and we, we had a lot of fun. Um, he's unbelievable. He's so unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and we've had a, a number of guests there, so I, I won't go into the full list of everybody there. But the, um, you know, it's like you say, it's cool to have that connection with other people who are making music. Uh, my favorite thing to do is to work with, you know, I, if I described what I want to do, it would be to spend all day in the studio making music with my friends. <laughs> and yeah. that's what a tracking session can feel like. That's what an overdub session can feel like. Um but so a lot of times you're also by yourself doing stuff and that shared studio community gives everybody a chance to like, you still keep getting to check in with your friends and just, you know, up your game. You know, it's like a, there's an accountability. Um, I'm going to quote one of the artists in your playlist as Jody Doreen's record says, um, you guys are keeping it as real as a candy covered bullet over there. So that was a pretty good <laughs> line. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to wow. write that line down. <laughs> um, all right, man. So tell us more about your instruments. I mean, you started on drums, but you're also picking up a guitar. Anything else? And, and you know, you're producing and writing with people and you're involved in all aspects of creating music. Yeah, um, I play bass. Um, I love to play bass. I think it's probably my favorite instrument to play. Um, but... Uh, you know, I can play enough piano to get by, and and by that I mean I can I can plunk out single note things and whatever else. But when it comes to getting both hands to work together, that's pretty much gone. But yeah, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say, and and sometimes you just you got to figure out how to make certain things work with other instruments. But basically, you know, drums, guitar, and bass are kind of my I I don't like the word wheelhouse, but it's it's my comfort zone. Are you a singer as well? I am, yeah. Right on. Do we actually have one of your own records in the playlist? No, I didn't realize? no, okay. Okay. no. I, I made a re- the the last time I made a record of my own material was back in '98, and uh, I thought all copies were lost. And then a friend of mine from back home uh, found one as he was cleaning out a box and sent it to me, and I put it on, and uh, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> well, you got a cool sounding voice. So. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> it was to the point that I played it for my wife and just sort of embarrassingly, embarrassingly, you know, cowled in the corner and she just went and took it out and put it in the drawer where we keep the CDs by the record player in the house. Because she goes, we'll just put this here and nobody will ever hear this. <laughs> and and she's right to do so. But That's funny, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so tell us a little bit about your process of collaborating either in the songwriting, you know, in the production Obviously, you also just play drums for people as needed. But you know, if you're if you're sort of ushering a record from start to finish, what does a process like that look like to you? Well, I like to start. I hate starting with with produced demos if if I can avoid it. Um, I much prefer. I always ask the artist to to send me an acoustic guitar vocal because that is always the the litmus test and so that you can hear the song itself in its truest form. Because as the old adage goes, you should just be able to pick up a guitar and sing a song and it, and it should translate regardless of what else is on, you know, whatever's in the track or whatever that's going to be. Have you ever uh, heard me play yesterday? It doesn't always translate. <laughs> no, I can't say that I have. <laughs> Actually, I'm just kidding. I don't even know how to play it. <laughs> All right, keep um, going. Sorry, I'll, st- I'll try to chill out here. <laughs> no, you're fine, you're fine. Um, but it's, for me, it's, I like the idea of, of building something from the ground up like that. Um, 
because when you're listening to just an acoustic guitar and a vocal, you you hear all sorts of other melodies going on and you know maybe a guitar part here and there or like a background vocal thing or just something that that creates melody around what's there. And, and as long as the song is is to a point where um you know it's good enough to just stand on its own with a with a voice and, and a guitar, then from there you can kind of you know the world is your oyster. Um, I read an article years and years and years ago with Nigel Godrich where he talked about working with Radiohead. And I used to sit and listen to those records all the time and, and just be, had no concept of like, how do you, you know, what do you, do you just sit down in a room and the five of you make the, you know, you, you play Paranoid Android and go, well, we're geniuses. Oh, that's lunch. I'll see you later. Yeah. And, you know, and I never, I didn't quite understand that. And he talked about this well, what, you know, I put Tom in a booth and we do an acoustic and a vocal and then we just build things around it. And it was something, it was a concept that I knew of, but it just, it really put things into perspective for me. And that's, that's the way I like to start with it because, um, if I can avoid it, I don't, I will, I like to build things kind of part by part and instrument by instrument. Um, I will do bass and drums together just to give so that there's a bit more of that energy of, of people playing in a room together and, and maybe get a guitar player to come in and do some some rhythm stuff. But I, I really love the idea of taking time with the guitar parts. And, you know, I'd, I would rather spend a day overdubbing and working on getting the right things to happen so that something is truly special. Because when you're recording people in a room, and you're working on a project and you know you've got a guy for three or four hours on on a session i mean it's a lot of pressure to try and capture that lightning in a bottle right you know and that's that's ultimately what you're trying to do and and i i personally think that when when you've got these four hour sessions and you've got a room full of guys like you're it's kind of a numbers game like you're just throwing it up against the wall like you're going to get something ultimately that's that's incredible but it's not always special yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Jokes are just going through my head. Like, <laughs> drop, you know, pull them out, man. You well, he, he talked <laughs> about you know the world is your oyster, and I was like, I was like, oh, so wait, what does that mean? That it's like really expensive for just a few of them, and they're hard as shit to open. <laughs> 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 but, but you know, oh, sorry, I'll fast forward. So, talking about the guitar players, you know, my my uh, funny interpretation of what you said is um, drummers and bass players. You know, they they really bring it. And guitar players kind of phoning in a little on the sessions, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But but part of that thinking is, you know, there's also a joke like with with the bass. It's one of the few instruments um, where you know it's an instrument where you cannot miss the one. You like have to hit the root note and know where it is, and you have to know where you're going. With guitar, I've heard people describe it as like you can kind of fake it a little bit. You can kind of miss the one, you know. And then hit the chord change. <laughs> you yeah. got to you got to know the changes on bass. I know with a chart, you know, we don't have to worry about that. But with guitar players, I've heard it described on a session is is um you know sometimes a guitar player feels like it's more valuable to hold back and be a little conservative with some of the parts in tracking because for reasons like you don't know where they're going to go with the song. You know, if you overcommit to some things it can actually, it could potentially hinder the production. So it's interesting to hear you talk about this, you know, I think you're saying like, it can be more effective to do a focused guitar overdub session because it gives you a little more freedom to explore the possibilities and the melodic and harmonic ideas and make a bold move maybe at that point without feeling like you're you're gonna blow the tracking session for everybody else. Yeah, I mean, you can just put it under a little bit more of a microscope, you know, I say this to a lot of people all the time, but the the records that that have stood the test of time that we all love, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them were spent. You know, they they took a lot of time to make, you mm -hmm. know, um, for various different reasons. But a lot of it that is, you know, guys like Bob Rock and 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 Mutt Lang and you know Rick Rubin and you know Eric Valentine, all these guys like they 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 spend time on the sounds they spend time on finding the right parts and I, there's there's a lot of value to that especially if you're trying you know if you have a, a batch of songs that are really really fantastic they they deserve that time you know they it, it and sometimes you can get it kind of on the first first try but you know sometimes you also have to get in there and then totally rip the whole song apart and start over again 
Yeah. You know, and it, and it's that it's that time and those overdub sessions and and whatnot where where you you get to that place where you can actually make something that's really really truly special. Yeah, and typically the drums are going to be one of the first things that gets done right early. I mean, yeah. I, I remember first records I did. Um, actually, I shouldn't even say first records, plural. Like the the first record I got hired as an assistant. Uh, the drummer, you know, he was done with his parts early. It was a two week thing, and you know, he was off like reading a book for a lot of the session yeah. out, out in the kiddie pool because it was a summertime session. And that was my introduction to that idea. It's like, oh yeah, drums drums get done first on records, you know. It's the, it's the foundation to the to the stew. You yeah. Know? The first time I heard a Carl Tatz Phantom Focus mix room featuring his PFM HD 1000 series monitors, I was completely blown away. It was like listening to three-dimensional sound with rock-solid bass all the way down to 20 hertz. It was really incredible. What's amazing is that a Phantom Focus system can be implemented in your existing control room or even bedroom studio, giving you world-class sound for mixing. Go see how cool your studio could look and sound at phantomfocus.com. Um, what about that though? How much, you know, so one of the challenges to getting the drums done first and not having all those guitars is making mistakes sometimes where like later you come back and you're like, shit, I thought those drums were cool. They're not as cool as they needed to be. Um, do you run into that sometimes? Are there solutions for that? It could be like, oh shit, that snare doesn't sound nearly as enough for this song or it sounds too big for this production, um, or the cymbals are, you know, not doing the right thing, you know, or like, you know, the energy's not right. So talk a little bit about that. How do you get the bass and the drums to have the appropriate energy so that when you do get to the guitars, you're neither, you haven't either overdone it or you're not lacking? Well, generally, I, once I hear a song that I really connect with from an artist, I, I have a very, very clear idea in my mind um, of what I want it to be, and it's not even—it's not even so much that it, that it's a conscious decision that's made about okay, boom, whack, boom, boom, whack, fill, chorus. You know, it's more of an energy. Like I, the, I go in and and just kind of play it as and play the song with some energy, the way and try and interpret the way that that song makes me feel. Like if it's a you know a slow, sad ballad sort of thing, all I tend to sit back on the time a little bit and and you know that that emotion that the that the song evokes in me kind of becomes an extension of my limbs while I'm playing and I try and do that and I you don't always land there I mean I've recorded the whole things where I've gone back and completely recut the drums um that that uh, in my discography there that you'd listen to um the color there's a song on there and I'm going to blank on the name but uh, I was in LA mixing it, um, and I didn't love the drum sounds that I had. And uh, I went in and I recut the drums and the bass uh, in LA and recut a couple of guitars because the the drums were super aggressive for this very delicate ballad. Um, and I wanted something that was a little, you know, softer touch, kind of in the Joey Warner Warrenker. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, kind uh -huh. of vibe, like real soft touch. He played with Beck for a while and REM and a bunch of stuff, but just that that kind of thing. And I mean, nothing is nothing is sacred with with the recording process. Like, and I am the first person to call myself out and and know that when if the drums need to be changed or something needs to be changed, it's just going to get fixed because it it just has to be right. Yeah. And anything yeah, outside of making it as as right as it can be is just laziness and you're not doing yourself or or the song or the artist any any services that way just kind of letting things slide like that well so and then of course we have other tools than the drummer and even the drums because there are triggers and and you know variations of sounds that you can create later do you find that to be useful or do you find that to be a cheat that it's better to avoid it just depends on the project. Um, I find that drum samples uh, are great when you're doing a really thick kind of uh, radio sounding single, but I work on a lot of really stripped down um, what you know what they what they're calling Americana music now, mm -hmm. and it, that just doesn't translate for me. I, I would for the amount of time that I would spend, you know, say fixing a snare drum or a kick drum. I mean, these are not generally the drum sounds that you're going for are not close mic drum sounds. I mean, you're, you're doing, 
or I'm doing anyway, a lot of like uh, three and four drum, you know, three and four mic setups um, for these things. Um, and you, you actually can't use a sample to try and change the snare drum sound because I'm trying to capture the, you know, the more ambient sound of the drum kit and not the sound of a kick drum mic and a snare drum mic that are, you know, right up close on everything. So I, it, sometimes samples can be useful, but a lot of times for the, at least the stuff that I'm working on, it, it, uh, it's not. Well, now I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit because there's also a lot of, you know, great, powerful rock tracks in your <clears> discography. <throat> and then rock stars, of course, we've got a playlist of, uh, Jay's music in the show notes. So just scroll down on your phone and that can take you right there. Uh, just go to the website link and and we've got a playlist there so you can listen to all these on Spotify. But like, for example, um, again, Jody Doreen Unbreakable is a totally in-your-face kind of production and, you know, the drums are super punchy and everything's just like right there, loud and proud. You know, there's a, there is a thing that I discovered in Nashville about and began to appreciate because I, I didn't come here as a fan of country music, but I became, I grew to be a fan of the production and the sound that goes into stuff um, in country music. And actually, I got to say, I got to even take it a step further and say that your playlist sounds so good, Jay, that I was like, shit, man, this might make me a fan of country music. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, I have to say that that record I, I produced and, and engineered most of it, but uh, Howard Willing actually mixed that record with the exception of uh, the song Together, which was a last minute edition that I mixed myself. Um, and was actually the the first song that I ever mixed for a project that was going to be put out and that people were actually going to hear. And I was terrified because um, I hold Howard in such high regard and, and he's been uh, um, somewhat of a mentor to me and and helped some things. It was pretty nerve wracking to be like, OK, I got to mix this song because he doesn't have time. And, and it ended up turning out, thankfully. But um, yeah, Howard, the biggest thing I got from Howard uh, is his drum sounds are always great. And he knows how to make drums super punchy, and and uh, and it, it's very evident on that record because of the the drums on that thing are just raging on pretty much every song. Yeah, Howard's great. He's also a guest on Recording Studio Rockstars. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's see. Let's let's jump into some. Let me just drop some names of records and just tell us what you want to tell about them. Um, all of these years, the Steel Woods. That stuff is great. Great rock stuff. I think you're playing with those guys a lot. Um, or you're a member of the band. <laughs> Not sure. I, I, yeah, I was. I've been out of the band for about a year and a half. Okay, but, uh, great, great. Um, but, you know, the record rocks. Um, there's some YouTube videos that I've found of you playing with those guys, too. There's fantastic singing on that. Um, tell us more about that project. Well, that came up. I was uh, I was working out of Eastside Manor for a little while, and um, just through friends and different things, uh, I was approached by them to, because uh, the core of the band was uh, was Wes Bayless, who's the singer, and then uh, Jason Cope, who was the guitar player. Um, and he, I was asked to just come in and play uh, a couple of shows with them. And then, you know, through the course of uh, uh, all of that, Rowdy sat down with me and, and uh, who's, uh, asked if I wanted to be a part of it. And um, I kind of went into it, you know, I was probably... 38, you know, and do you want to join a band when you're 38? Just sounds kind of crazy to me, but, um, how about, do you want to have a, your first kid when you're 37? That was my question. <laughs> well, I'm 43 now. I'm hoping to have some kids this year. So I'll be, right uh, you'll yeah, do great, be, man. You'll do great. I can, I can testify. I'll be an, I'll be an old man about it, but, uh, but the Steelwoods just, uh, you know, it, it was a really, really great experience. It, it took off very quickly. Like I, I really liked playing with them. I really liked the songs and what they were doing and their, you know, their approach. They just, you know, no bullshit, just two guitars, bass, drums. Let's go out and kick the shit out of it and, and try and leave a little blood on the stage every night. And it was, it was great. What's wrong uh, with bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> no tracks, no, no, no nothing. It was just, you know, I think awesome. our, yeah, our, our patch list was like 16 ins and, uh, I just, I love that shit. And it's um, dual guitars, right? Two guitar players, one on the left, one on the right, I think. Yeah, the, the, the singer uh, play guitar as well. And then, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was great. And I got to, it was a really great opportunity because I got to play on the first record with them. And then we, we cut the second record, Old News, out in uh, Asheville at Echo Mountain. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I love that place so much. And uh, 
it was just awesome. But I got to tour and see a lot of places I'd never thought I would I would get to see and and um, play in front of some really great crowds and and but you know we were gone a lot. You know we did at least 150 shows a year for three years and and uh, it just got to a point for me that I really wanted to get back into making records again because with our touring schedule I didn't have a lot of time to do that and it made it very difficult for me to get anything done and I was really really missing that part of my of my life so I made the decision to to leave in September of 2019 and uh, but it was one of the best experiences of my life when you guys were at Echo Mountain were you recording with Julian Dreyer over there yeah I love cool. that guy yeah Julian was just on he just he just beat you to the podcast uh, oh really I just I I, uh, I I was texting with him this morning right on tell him I said yeah. hi I will um all right, so cool. So you're not playing with those guys, so you kind of transitioned into the studio. I mean, one of the things about your drumming style that is very clear to me is you have confidence and you know how to to have a con- really steady energy and power to a song. And I can you can see that immediately just even in the, you know, the crappy phone camera from the back of the stage at the festival. Right. You know, on your YouTube videos. Um what is part of the process for you about, you know, learning, you know, what what question do I even want to ask about that? You know, like, <laughs> do you remember, you know, being kind of shaky with your drums and then and then gaining a sense of confidence that helps the drum part translate really well onto a record? Is there any tips or or anything you want to share about about that? Um yeah, I mean I've been playing drums since I was eight or nine and it was just something that I could always do. I, I just, I'm, I'm a visual learner. So I would watch music videos and, and listen and go we'll figure out what uh, body motion equated with what sound. So, you know, he's lifting his leg, that's the kick drum and I, and, and the hi hat is this and the symbols are this and a ride symbol is over here. And, and I very quickly learned the mechanics of how all of that worked. What, what you mean, like the video of the guy who's doing like the massively over the top ACDC drumming, who's like sp- <laughs> spinning his <laughs> arm over his head on every hit? I forgot which one that is. Uh, you know oh, what the, I'm talking about? Yeah, the guy with the flames drum kit. That that this drummer's obviously on the wrong gig. That thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I would I would watch Phil Rudd in ACDC videos and 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 go, oh, well, that's easy. I can do that. And I could, I could just kind of always play. And, but it wasn't until I started really taking being a studio drummer really, really seriously, you know, for, you know, pop, pop rock music and, and, and country music, getting to be the guy that can do all of those things. Like before that, I was, I was playing a lot of stuff where there was a lot of notes and, uh, you know, big drum kits and, and elaborate things. And I was a lot of the gigs that I was on, um, I was expected to play a lot, you know, a lot of sort of gospel chops and, and metal things right, and, right. and whatever else. But it was once I decided that I wanted to try and be the studio guy. And because I was, I started getting calls because I was touring with that band in Canada. Um, that was a country band, you know, like, well, you know, like, well, you, you know, you play with them. So obviously, you know what you're doing. I had no idea. Uh-huh. You know, I didn't, I didn't know the, the brilliance that was, you know, a drummer like Steve Ferroni or, you know, um, one of the big ones for me was Chris McHugh here in Nashville. I mean, he played on, he's, he's on a million records and he was playing with Keith Urban and, uh, I had this live DVD and I would just, I would watch him and watch him and watch him and figure out, he has this great way of transferring energy from a verse section to a chorus to a bridge and and making the the song and the energy of the song feel very very different but it's a very very subtle thing yeah and i had it and i had i still had no idea how to do it and i would go in and do these you know these country sessions and and i'd, I'd hear it back and it's like well that just sounds like shit and i you know i'm not nailing that kind of feel and a lot of it came from getting control of, for me anyway, what works for me is is my hi-hat uh, or ride cymbal hand um, really dictates the pocket of everything and the way that you play those respective cymbals on the drum kit. You know, like you can, to use a real extreme sort of thing, like, you know, use Phil Rudd from ACDC, like listen to anything that he plays on. There's this real swampiness and the way that he plays the hi-hat, it's almost like a sweeping motion. 
You right never on. really see him like chopping on the thing, but then you watch a drummer like Questlove, who's very sort of up and down and linear, and he's really just like, pop, pop, ta, 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 ta. it's very even and very, um, for a lot of those types of feels. And the way to make the drums feel differently and move differently through the song is, for me anyway, is just changing the way that I, I approach and, and play those things from a really wide sweeping thing to, uh, you know, or just really chopping on it and then everything in between. And that dictates sort of where the, uh, it makes the kick drum and the snare drum move within the time. Because if you put the hi-hat a little more on top, it makes everything else feel behind. And then likewise, if you put the hi-hat really behind, it kind of, to me anyway, it just pushes the momentum of the song forward. <laughs> I love using Isotope plugins for my music and podcast productions. In fact, you're hearing Ozone and RX on my voice in this podcast episode. And now you can get access to all the Isotope plugins through the new subscription bundle. For only $19.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Nectar, Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and more, including free plugin updates. And just for you rock stars, get an extended 30-day free trial subscription at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscription. The Envoy Pro Electron is the fastest, toughest, mini-sized, universal portable USB-C SSD that lets you record from anywhere in the galaxy with confidence. With speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron gives you high-speed audio data for recording and playback. Take your sessions and sample libraries with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof dustproof and crush proof never worry about the storage and safety of your work again find the new owc envoy pro electron and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars hey rockstars we're back now for the jam session my guest today is jay took joining us from pentaveret studio b in berry hill nashville jay you ready to jam dude I love to jam. Love to jam. All right. <laughs> so you were bringing up a great point. You're talking about the mechanics of drumming. I think that applies to everything in the studio, the mechanics of singing on a mic, um, different ways to hit the hi-hat. I think of Ringo Starr doing that like side-to-side hi-hat and ride motion. Yeah. And, and I think we forget that the mechanics of what we're physically doing has a huge impact on the result and the sound of of what we hear. And sometimes if you find something that sounds like it could be a problem in the recording, that's the first place to go look. You know, talk a little bit more about the mechanics of how we play our instruments and where those begin to present problems in different instruments and different tracks. I mean, you know, the drums is an obvious thing, but the way that people fret and play a guitar is can create tuning issues. Um, it totally things can be wrong. I mean, if, if, uh, you know, people don't know how to get the, the, the right, have the right kind of touch when they're playing the guitar, like coming in and playing a ballad and, and playing too hard and, and beating the living shit out of the strings doesn't help anybody. String squeaks, uh, string squeaks, you know, stuff like that. Um, singers is probably the biggest thing because there's, there's a lot of, uh, mechanics to the, the way that the human, body works and the way that sound comes out of your mouth that a lot of people don't realize and you know things like having tension in your shoulders and in your neck muscles and 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 all of those things like a lot of especially with with newer singers that have never been in a studio before probably the most common thing that I have to get them to do is I walk them through some breathing exercises and and some stretching and and get them to find that place where their shoulders are relaxed because when they're tense, you know, you don't think about it, but your shoulders start to come up and, and all of those muscles tighten up and, and that constricts all the, you know, the, the vocal cords. And, and once the muscles in your neck are really tight, 
the tone isn't as big and, and it can get really tight sounding and, and not open and big and, and beautiful. And that's, that's probably the thing that I run into the most is this helping singers sort of find that space where they're not, they're not all choked up and their voice changes and gets really tight and, and let them just helping them find a place where they allow the note to come out where they're not trying to push the note out. You know? Yeah. There's, there's, in fact, I just added a YouTube video to your playlist um, it's called the five minute vocal warm up. It's this guy who's like, now we are going to do the goo with the Google sound. You yeah. Know? And it's like, even just something as simple as that is just these vocal warm ups, you know, video free videos on YouTube can make a huge difference. Like when I was singing on my own record. Um, and it's, it's cool to hear you talk about that, that tightness in the neck, uh, you know, headphone volumes can affect people, right? Yeah, and I and I've even heard that you know even the how dim or how bright the lights are. If you change that in the middle of something, it'll it'll change. Uh, it can change their the way that they perceive the pitch that they're singing. You heard that from Bobby Holland. I'm positive of it. <laughs> no, I I prob I think I heard that from Howard. Well, I, Bobby, I know he's he talked also about you know the most valuable addition to his studio was getting all those Wi-Fi bulbs where he can completely change the mood. It's so good. It's it's a, it's a crazy little thing, but the fact that we can control the color and the and the and the the you know I hate this word, but the vibe in in the, you know the ambience and the way that it it sits in this room, it's it's pretty great, and it makes a pretty big difference because they're able to. It helps people relax when you can get them in in a in a in a situation where they're really comfortable like that. Don't hate vibe. I mean, vibes are a percussion instrument, technically. Right? Yeah, I know. It's just such an over. It's just it's it's just this blanket word that describes everything. <laughs> Where does it come from? Is does vibe mean the mood, and then that got applied to the instrument, or does the instrument create create a mood, and so everybody started saying the vibe? Well, I think I think the vibe just comes from the way that the studio feels when you walk in. And then, <laughs> no, like I just mean the the word. Where does even the word even come from? But go ahead. Who knows? Who, know, who knows, man? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's how you come into the studio and how it feels. Um, keep going on that that topic. Sorry. Um, yeah, like once getting in here and having having the, I can set the lights. Like once we get everything set up, I'll 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 ask people, especially if I've got a band or something working. It's like you know what color do you need it in the room, and they'll call a color out for a song, and then we'll we'll work for a couple hours with everybody tracking and we'll make it blue or whatever it is. And it, it's, it's a silly little thing, but all of our senses are connected to everything that we do. And I'm a pretty firm believer that that, that translates through the way that they're playing and the way that they approach. And, that it, and you know, it's like, it's like being in a bar back in, you know, when, when you would towards the, towards the end of the night and then the lights would come on. I mean, your entire, everything about your existence in that moment changes because yeah. they've turned the lights on, you know? Yeah. Uh, the other thing they would do in one of the bars we were in was they would play that Lou Reed record that's all noise at <laughs> top volume so that everybody would just want to leave. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's cool to hear you mention that too. So Rockstars, of course, you're probably familiar with the Wi-Fi bulbs now where you can change the color using your iPhone and stuff like that. Um you know, one of the discussions I had with somebody was whether or not you would actually do that or whether you just kind of keep them on white and just dim it. So therefore, do you just need white bulbs? But it's cool to hear you talking about how you guys are consistently doing that and choosing colors and changing things and making that part of, you know, another aspect of the studio experience that the band and the artists can choose. Yeah, I mean, all it, like I said, all the senses are connected and it, it's important to get yourself in an environment that's comfortable to you and, and maybe feels good because, you know, color, like color, it's the same as smell. I mean, I'll run certain, certain, uh, oils and stuff in the studio when we're working on things that just kind of sets a mood in a certain way and, and, you know, try and make it this full immersive experience that, and it's not even something that I, I will tell the artist that I'm doing. It's just, I kind of know that uh, what makes me feel good and hopefully it does the same for them. So. Jay, can you come over here and just work my shoulders a little more, please? <laughs> Not that kind of oil. <laughs> okay, cool. So tell us about the song that you did with Jesse Terry on the record Kaleidoscope, which I would describe as a pretty awesome power psychedelic pop record. That uh, that record was produced by my good friend, Mr. Josh Kaler. Um, and Josh is one of those uh, phenom uh, musicians that can play anything, and it's just a, an, an endless source of incredible ideas 
Um, Josh and I were working together uh, out of Eastside Manor. And he was getting to the end of, of tracking that. And I had gone in. Um, Josh had, we were, you know, we had same similar vibe to what we had here over at, uh, at Pentaver. But Josh and I were kind of going back and forth and, and helping each other with mixes and, and passing ideas and things. And he asked me to sit down and uh, help him out with one of these songs. And Runaway Town was the one that we started with. And I basically mixed the, te- the, the song from, from the ground up and kind of got it to a place. And then uh, from there, you know, helped Josh uh, a, li- a very little bit because it didn't take him very long. to. We, w- we were basically trying to figure out the, uh, you know, the sonic approach and what, we, what he wanted the record to feel like. And I think we established it at the beginning and then he was just kind of off to the races. But um, Jesse's such a great artist. He's got such an incredible voice and writes really, really beautiful beautiful songs and uh it was it was a lot of fun to work on that with those guys because they were around working out of the a room over there and i was in the b room and uh getting to watch them create this thing i was i was very excited to even be a part of it for that one song what were some of the things um that you you know that you enjoy about mixing i don't remember specifically if you really change sounds in that mix but but mixing in general um you know for example that record had drums where sometimes it sounded like, you know, there was some delay added to the drums to the side, or or I've heard other uh, tracks in your discography where the guitar is playing and then there's like a, a an extra delay added or something, you know, that's panned. Talk about your process of mixing when you do and how many things seem appropriate to save towards the mix as opposed to creating you know, a, a sound or a space when you actually mic up the instrument, uh, you know, at the guitar or at the drums or through an overdub. Right. Um, I really try and, and save myself some room when I'm tracking. Um, there's a lot of engineers in, in Nashville that I will watch that are, and they're so good at it where they will just commit ridiculous amounts of compression and different things, um, which I have done on occasion, um, you know, to create some kind of really bombastic weirdo kind of sound. But um, w- when I'm engineering something and then when I get, I try and save myself some room to have some options as you know, when I'm mixing. So, because I, my biggest thing is I, I try not to, I don't want anything to feel stock, um, as much as possible. I like to use, uh, things like instead of reverbs, like lately I've been using, um, a lot of, uh, spring or, uh, um, short, very short, like 30 second delays, mm-hmm. uh, instead of a like a mono reverb so i'll run the feedback really long and the mix of, you know a little bit lower but just so you get this sort of like blah, 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 thing that happens within the reverb yeah. as, as you know and you just find a place and it creates this this really interesting depth especially on a vocal it's a really really cool thing and then you can you can blend that in with like a stereo plate and you get this really interesting push pull that happens um, and I'll, and a lot of times I'll run that, that delay when I'm using it as a reverb on the vocal channel itself, which, um, not really sure what it does or why I do it. It's just, it's been working for me. So I've been, I've been doing that and then, you know, sending out to different auxes for the, for the reverbs and stuff. But, you know, my approach is just to sit down and I always do the, the, let's get a fader up, make it sound as good as we can before I even reach for an EQ or do any of that kind of stuff. And then from there, you start to see where the space or see and hear where the spaces are in the mix that you can start filling up with things. And it's about emphasizing maybe a guitar part or like a vocal thing, or sometimes it's like a hand clap or something where you can, you know, you've got a moment where you can create a really cool moment out of this little thing by adding, you know, by crushing it or adding some weird kind of thing to it and making it all fucked up sounding and and um, like later in the mix process, you can have that freedom because you didn't commit to it too far. Initially. Yeah, but but sometimes I will, um, you know, like the the Lindy Ortega EP that I did a few years ago. That was that was a big lesson for me in trying to get it as cool sounding as I could on the way in. You know, she she recorded. Uh, we cut that. She played acoustic guitar and sang live. Yeah. In in the bathroom at my old studio, which is this big open kind of shitty sounding room, but it had a thing about it. And then, you know, we did no click or no anything. It was, I had a, uh, an RCA 77 on her voice and a 57 on her acoustic and I just let her go. And then we built the tracks around what she sang. 
That's great. You're answering so many of my questions. I'm crossing them <laughs> off as you go. I was going to ask you about working with Lindy Ortega and the great use of reverb on the vocals and acoustic guitar. So that's so it sounds like you let the space introduce some of that, you know, in yeah, the bathroom that, setting. Yeah, and you can when you listen to it, like it's 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 kind of a it's a really obnoxious kind of short. Sounds like a bathroom reverb. Now, did she, did you have to ask her if she actually had to go? Well, <laughs> the funny thing was, you know, she came in. I produced that with uh, with uh, Jason, with Rowdy, who was the guitar player in the Steelwoods. Uh, yeah. He and I worked on that together. And uh, we we were just trying to, I was trying to find a space where it sounded good for her. And then she was in the bathroom and, and she was singing in there. And I was like, why don't we just try this? And she literally sat on the toilet and played and sang the the three acoustic songs and then we used the piano in, in my room for the other song but That's it was awesome. just one of those it was it was literally like i could just hear singing through the wall i was like well you know flush and we'll hang some mics and see what happens and and That's funny, there's there's funny. the record yeah i mean we've done that before too where we've had a mic in the bathroom for a particular sound and then it's also really funny if you're in the middle of a session and somebody takes a break and you're like oh you rush into the console to go mute the bathroom mic because <laughs> they're in there, you know. <laughs> but I mean, you know, just just putting mics in different spaces, you know, the funny thing is like a bathroom is like, yeah, we, we sit, it's one of the first places you learn how to sing. You sing in the shower, you know. But it's yeah. also like the last place you would think of to stick a mic and record. But, you know, if you can discover those weirdo places around your studio or your house, I mean, it's one of the things that makes a house so compelling to record in. I mean, you're talking about being over at at um, uh, um, Eastside Manor with Todd. Yeah. You know, a real house space. Um, is that you? You create. You have access to genuine sounds that way. That as place, to, you know, careful. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just. Yeah, I was. I should have shut up. Go ahead. <laughs> you go ahead. That that place for me was was a real exercise in. Uh, that was a real kind of turning point for for the my engineering career. In that, I went from making uh, a lot of you know close micy, very radio friendly kind of music. And when I started working in there, because Todd had the echo chamber and the live room had these twenty six foot ceilings and a concrete floor. I mean, it was just you could do and try just about anything that you could ever imagine sonically. Like a lot of Jesse's record when we were working on that, um, you know, there's a lot of things where it's him singing and doing background vocals in the echo chamber with the mic up. That's that's the reverb that you're hearing. It's not, um, and same with the, you know, the big tracking room, like we would put things out there and do percussion overdubs, put the mic like 20 feet away and you get this like insanely long, natural, goofy sounding thing. And that I really, started to understand uh, the idea that the space really does dictate the sound of a studio and also very much dictates the sound of a record. I mean, it's like yeah. when you watch the Sound City documentary and they talk about, well, you know, this room has a sound. It does have a sound. You, if you, When you watch that documentary and you sit down and listen to every single one of those records, there is a, there is a tonal thread that runs through all of them, whether it's a Dio record or a Fleetwood Mac record or whatever the fuck else. There's there's a thing that happens there, and I really got into the idea of finding. Uh, I, I went from oh well, this doesn't sound right. I'm going to go and reach for an EQ while we're tracking. If if this doesn't sound right, I'm just going to go out and move the microphone and and make that be, let that do all of the work, and really focusing on the actual source material being. Um, what dictates and 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 what this is going to sound like as opposed to trying to grab a plug in and grab a create a room re reverb it's like i would rather put a microphone up and and you know uh, let let the space like our our room here at pentaverit is one of the coolest sounding drum rooms that we have and it's great for acoustic guitar and vocals and all kinds of things it just has there's a sound in this room and it's that has been that's been the best part of the last few years for me is is getting away from let's put 25 mics on something and, and let's try and find the easiest way to capture this beautiful sounding instrument or voice or whatever it is and let this and, and sort of find it within this space and then and then 
you know, 80% of your work is done. Yeah. I mean, it's also a really great place for whiskey shots during the Christmas party. So I'm looking forward to that again. <laughs> you know, I heard, I've heard the stories of this incredible, uh, Christmas party that they have around here. And I've, I, uh, I'm sad that because of COVID that I, that I missed it. It'll come back. It'll come back sooner than later, hopefully. One of the challenges for recording your voice is getting close enough to the microphone that you get a great bass boost proximity effect without getting blasts of wind on the microphone. Try this experiment. Hold your hand in front of your mouth and say, peanut butter popcorn. Feel that blast of air on your hand? That will cause a terrible sound on your microphone called a plosive. My favorite way to avoid this is to use the Jay-Z microphone pop filter in front of a mic. This thing is built like a tank with a flexible metal arm that I can clamp directly onto the mic stand. It has a super cool waveguide design that looks like ripples on water and prevents the plosives getting through to the mic no matter how explosive the voice gets. Plus, it lets the high frequencies through for superb clarity on the mic. Get your vocals just right and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 20% off the amazing pop filter at jzmike.com. The STX100D from the Spectra 1964 Custom Shop is the big brother to the now famous STX100. A fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers, the STX100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Ardent, AdVision, AM, and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500 lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 complimenter, then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX. X100 mic pre and C610 complimenter in a single 500 module. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dow with the STX mic pre's, BBDI, and complimenters. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. So to maybe talk more about the acoustic guitar voice thing, because you nailed that on the Lindy or Ortega record. What are some of the ways that work well for recording acoustic? You know, and you're doing a lot of Americana stuff now. So what are things that we need to be thinking about when it comes to acoustic and vocal and, ma and building a record? You know, should we record them separately? Should we record them together? What are the challenges we'll run into? Um, how do we solve those? Really just, for me anyway, it just depends on um, what it, if I'm going to do a live acoustic guitar vocal, um, the first thing I'm going to try and do is is balance it with one microphone as best I can. And okay, so that. one mic that's getting the voice and the acoustic. Yeah. Yeah, I love recording that way. Talk more about that. Yeah, it's and it's a, a little bit more work. Um, the nice thing is, is you don't have to worry about phasing between the two things and trying to get all of that sorted out. but. I also think that for the artist, I think the fewer mics that you hang in front of somebody, the less intimidated they feel and the more relaxed they can get into what they're trying to do. Yeah. You know, they stop worrying about, okay, you can't turn the guitar, otherwise we're going to have too much low end from the whatever else. I mean, if you can, you know, hang a good ribbon mic in front of a guy that knows how to properly play an acoustic guitar, whether it's a finger picking thing or whatever, and, and has a nice balanced voice and you can find that spot, again, like that's 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 half the work done for you and you know i i i got real hip to that with uh um there's a butch walker record called oh shoot there's a song on there that that uh i've seen footage from the studio and it's it's just him and a and a 44 and a 12 string acoustic and it's like four feet away from him in wow. a nice tight sounding room and he starts this thing off and it's like yeah that sounds the reason that sounds so good and why it sounds like a human being playing guitar and singing is because it's a microphone capturing a human being playing guitar and singing. Yeah. You know, cause it's, it's, it's so easy to complicate and, and I'm so, I'm so guilty of this just like anybody else. It's really easy to overcomplicate trying to capture a great performance. And it, 
when it comes to you know vocal and acoustic guitar things like there's like on the charlie argo record that's on that i sent over like there's a really great uh song on there called potter station that he played acoustic guitar and sang and uh i played drums live in the room and then i nice. opened up the bass and that's the song and it's drums it's, it's, live with the acoustic yeah Which and, is, and the it can be a challenge right yeah and but I, you know it's my job at that point my job is the drummer to not be super loud and be an asshole but you know i had there's one mic on charlie and his acoustic that's not even there's not an acoustic guitar mic no, oh, no i'm sorry i'm sorry there is there is but still there's that whole session is uh nine tracks of audio wow and then do you um if you're gonna do that did you just listen with no headphones so you could hear the acoustic in the room to play along to it or do you get into headphones and if you do get into headphones where do we run into problems with the drums? I, I listened in the room. It's the only way to really have an accurate uh, uh, idea of how loud you're playing. Right, because if you put headphones on, all of a sudden you just play louder, and then they can't hear it, and then everybody's asking to turn the, their mic up in the headphones. Yeah, it, 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 if it very quickly turns into when the levee breaks as opposed to, you know, subterranean homesick blues. <laughs> That's cool. And, yeah. you know, and it's such a good reminder that that it, that is even possible to have an acoustic guitar in a space right next to drums and have the two work together because they can work together. Um, but you really have to, it has to be at the appropriate volume for that space. Yeah, it it it's it's very dependent on the people that you have in front of of the microphone because you you can't do that with everybody, you know you can't and I and I'm really referring to and speaking to you know people that don't have never really been in a recording studio much that can be a very uh, daunting thing to them because it's they don't understand the the mechanics there we are back to mechanics again of it all it really all just comes down to you know how how you sound. Uh, playing your respective instrument, and if you can make something as simple as just hanging a microphone and making that work. Yeah. Well, I did a couple of records with an artist named Amy Loftus, and the first one we did was just sort of traditional studio setting, overdub vocals and everything. And when we came to the next one, there was, I don't even remember whether a discussion of budget showed up first, but it became evident that we might want to do a lot in a little bit of time. And I proposed that we do a live to two track session and yeah. we and we did it like that where she was singing and playing guitar with no headphones on and all the instruments were just sitting right around her and we just you know we just position things in such a way that it would make it work and there would not be um you know there wouldn't be uh too a good electric guitar too loud or we just put it in a hallway in a house and one of the things that i noticed right away about having somebody play and sing acoustic like that is her pitch just had a like just really sounded spot on and natural. It mm -hmm. really like hit the right place, I thought. And I and I've always been struck by that. It's like, you know, we don't realize what we what damage we do when we put people in headphones sometimes. Well, you start asking a lot of them, you know, in that they have, you know, they create their own mix and it just doesn't if you're extremely experienced, you know what you're after and you know what you're doing, but if it's if you're still pretty new and and that it, it's almost worse for you to do that if you're going to be in a position where you're playing as much of you, of what you're doing live. And I've heard uh, that Jay Joyce quite often sets your mix for you. Mm. Uh, and he's one of my favorite producers. And I, and I can see some value in that, in that he is making you react to the things that he wants you to react to as a player, as opposed to, you know, you getting in with the headphones in, it's like, well, you know, the drummer is going to want a bunch of bass and a bunch of whatever else. And it's the same idea as having people sitting, you know, like you said, with the, the girl that you worked with, like having her just sing in the air like that is a totally different thing. And it makes you play more naturally. And, and, and the performances are, I, I think are just better when you can do something like that. Yeah, and the drums were actually pretty close to her. I was Mark Pasapio was playing drums, and oh, nice. it was close. Um, and and then I don't think I realized it at the time, but later when I interviewed Matt Rossbang, he pointed out that benefit of actually bringing the vocal mic close to the drums if you're going to do that, so that the drums that do bleed into the vocal mic, which they're going to do, don't sound roomy and far away. They sound intimate and close, you know. 
Exactly. Yeah. And, and Matt's one of those guys that I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with Matt on a few things. Um, and he's, it was working with him that made me really made me completely rethink the way that I approached recording. Um, I played, uh, I met Matt, uh, I was playing with a guy named Jacob Stiefel. We did a record out at Sam Phillips in Memphis and I was just blown away at how, how simplistic Matt's approach was and how amazing everything sounded. You know, I showed up and there was four mics on the drums when we got ready to go. And I had seen that. I didn't know how to play quite right and balanced enough to make that really be a thing. But watching him capture sounds and use the sound of the room as a, as a whole and put that all together was, was really something that, um, seeing it in context, just, it, it changed my life and it changed the way that I, I, I make records. So, um, so maybe get into some specifics. If it's four mics on a kit and you were going to recreate that yourself now, what are some choices you would make? Um, my go-to is, you know, using the crotch mic or the front of kick or, you know, it's, it's called a lot of different things. Um, probably my favorite move for recording drums if it's not a big bashy kind of thing is i take a ribbon mic i have these ribbon mics uh made in detroit they're called masonovics and they're some of the best microphones i've ever heard um but i will put it in you know if i'm doing like a, a kind of a broken down thing like playing really soft with sticks or maybe a little more aggressively with some brushes i'll do kick snare floor tom hi-hat and a cymbal and i'll put that ribbon mic so that it's over top of kind of the middle of the kick drum Mm -hmm. and and face it so that the the diaphragm is facing towards the snare drum and then i'll run a d12 about six inches from the front of the kick drum and then whatever condenser mic du jour usually it's the 251 the upton 251 that we have here and i'll run that real low um almost at eye level with me when i'm sitting at the drums kind of over the snare drum and then i'll take another condenser mic um and put it you know, five to six feet, kind of depending on the tuning of the kick drum itself and find that point where there's a whole bunch of bottom end in that. And then I'll end up using that instead of for low end, uh, as opposed to trying to, you know, goose up the, the close kick drum mic. And it, it just gives it this, this beefier kind of rounder thing, but that ribbon mic over the kick drum, the amount of low end and clarity that comes out of that, like the, that, that'll be kind of 75% of that sound because it's nice and ambient and it's, it's still punchy, but you're not, it's not, you know, the sound of a 57 on a snare drum head. It's, it's a totally different thing. And then as long as you've got your cymbal kind of out of the direct eye line of, of those microphones, um, you get this really beautiful blend and you can get this incredible drum sound with four mics. That's so cool, man. Thanks for breaking that down like that. Um, when you're putting a ribbon over the beater side of the kick drum looking towards the snare, I guess one one of the questions is, doesn't the side of a ribbon, you know, it's ribbons are typically figure eight or they're all figure eight, doesn't the side of the ribbon mic cancel out the kick drum beater? So Sorry, I should sorry, I should be a little more clear. Um I realize that I'm 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 talking with my hands and you can't see. Uh, right. the I hang it over so if you think like the 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 batter side rim and then the resonant side rim of the drum. Yeah. It's actually over over the middle of the shell. Oh, the mic is over the middle of the shell. It's it's yeah. above the kick drum. Above the kick drum, about three to four inches. And oh, cool. And so now, how does it does it hear the beater of the kick? That mic. It, it does. Um, and a lot of it does, but not as much as it could. But what you get out of it is this really beautiful. As long as the kick drum is tuned relatively well, you get this really wonderful pillowy bottom end that you can kind of sculpt to taste in the mix and it's great those are that's the drum sound that i'm talking about and david's uh ep should be out uh is out now um but that's that's that drum setup that i use and i cut those drums in my control room um and it's just awesome there's and most of that i think i'm only on all of those songs there's only three mics in the mix and that's, most of it that's is, super is that cool. ribbon. Yeah, it's great. So the so the ribbon placement is again, it's above the kick drum, sort of halfway through the shell, and the rejection side of that figure eight is directly down at the kick, but the mic is sort of facing towards the snare. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. 
That's the best we can do on podcast rock stars. We yeah. just gotta we just gotta over describe to get it done. Yeah. Um, awesome, dude. Uh, well, that's pretty exciting. I'm going to have to go try that out. Do you think that would work with condenser mics as well if you didn't have ribbons but wanted to still explore these these kinds of sounds? Yeah, it I definitely does. It's definitely a different thing because I, I you don't get as much, um, the bottom end isn't as lush with the condensers, but it still works. Um, and it's a nice thing if you do it in Omni especially. Um but just the nature of ribbons and, and how they, they pick up sound is you get that because it's above the kick drum, you get this the ribbon reacting to that low end in a way that only a ribbon mic can do. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like ribbons um, pick up the after effects of low end. It's like, you know, something happened and then there's this extra bit of resonance and, the, and a ribbon will pick it up. I have a condenser mic from Jay-Z microphones called the V11 that that also has a little bit of that quality that I really love. It's, oh, like, nice. it's like a condenser that feels a bit like a ribbon, um, although it's just a, it's a fixed uh, cardioid pattern, not a figure eight. That's what those Masonovic uh, ribbons are like too. They, they feel like a, a condenser, like a, a ribbon condenser hybrid. Right on. Yeah, they're they're really really cool. If you've never checked them out, I mean, I don't I don't have any skin in the game with them, but man, they they're not dark like most ribbons are. They have this this inherent brightness to them, but it's just enough. It's almost like when you when you take a Coles and then you kind of goose up the 16k on it to give a little air on a vocal or something mm-hmm, like that. It mm-hmm. kind of does that all by itself, and they're they're just killer on everything. All right, groovy. We'll check those out. Um, Talk a, about your process for producing an artist again a little more, and you know the things that help you discover their true voice for a record, um, but still keeping it professional to your standards. Well, a lot of it is, and it you know it, it obviously varies from from person to person, but you know the the process of pre production and meeting an artist and getting to know them. I like to know what they listen to, and I like to know um, what kind of music really gets them off. Um, and you know, what, and maybe what, you know, what, what they started listening to when they started getting into music and and doing those things, because a lot of times, you know, we run into this where there's, you get artists that come in and they're, they're, they tend to worry a little bit more about, uh, the commercial aspect of what their music is going to sound like. And, and, and that gets placed first and foremost to actually making a statement or, or finding some, uh, having a making a great artistic statement on on what you're trying to record and what you're trying to do. So I like to sit with with people and just listen to music and and talk about what they like and and what sorts of things about the music that they love really excites them. Mm-hmm. And then and then trying to you know once we start working on their material sitting down and finding aspects of those things that excite that we can bring into the music that excites them and whether that's you know an energy of a uh, of a drum performance or like there's a you know a guitar sound or just something i mean there's there's a million different variables but it's about at the core of it is finding what makes you excited about music and how to translate that into your into your own material um a big philosophy that i've i've been working on and and adopting in my daily ritual is what i talked about earlier is that we all remember that time that we sat down with somebody and played music together for the first time. And I remember it was uh, eighth grade. There was a guy that I was in a music store and I was playing a Metallica riff and he sat down and started playing the rhythm guitar part beside me and my fucking head exploded, you know? Uh And, And we probably sat there and played Seek and Destroy for the better part of, I don't know, an hour until they kicked us out of the music store because we were, you know, 12, 13 year old punk ass kids but it's it's that that thing that we started doing this to begin with, and we should have that excitement and try and bring that into every project that we do. So I try and find that point where the artist is excited about it, and they stop thinking about, well, I'm, this you know, is this going to be on the radio? Is it good enough to do these things? And and the way that it gets to be good enough is that you you have to like it. You have to be excited about what's going on. And as soon as you stop thinking about all the peripherals that go about it and you get back to that place of the very first time you played with somebody or sang with a band or did whatever and, and, and use that as a, as a, a guideline through uh, and a, you know, maybe even a mantra to everything that you're working on when you're working on that said project, 
I just think that the music is always better. It's always better because when you're not trying to do something, you're just you're creating something and reacting to things that get you excited. There's an honesty to that, and that's what people react to. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I I feel like it took me a while to realize that the the best work you can do is the one that you love the most because you're just going to put your heart into it. Always. Yeah. Rock stars, I am super excited to announce that I'm doing a full studio remodeling here at the Toy Box Studio, headquarters of recording studio rock stars. I'm working with the amazing studio designer, Carl Tatz, to upgrade my control room to a Phantom Focus mix room, and have also been improving the sound of my entire studio room by room. The first time I heard one of Carl's Phantom Focus mix rooms featuring the PFM HD 1000 series monitors, I was completely blown away. It felt like I was listening to three-dimensional sound where I could close my eyes and reach out and touch the instruments with crystal clear bass radiating from a 50-foot wall of pure marble. It was by far the best sounding mix room monitors I have ever heard anywhere. Check out my complete interview with Carl Tatz on episode 50 of the podcast and discover the secret to massively improving your monitor setup at carltatzdesign.com slash mixroom dash mentor. Let's talk about some of the uh, specifics of, you know, recording, editing, mixing. Um, you're a drummer. You play on sessions. How do you count off at the start of a song? What do we need to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, most drummers can only count to four. So after that, it's time to go usually. So um, <laughs> expound on that question. A well, I mean, I, there's, there's many aspects to it. One is me learning to... Um, to encourage people to count, you know, one, two, one, two, three, and then start, you know, don't say the four because that's a little bit less of the sound in the room that you have to edit out um, yeah. at the beginning of something. But what's really funny and happens so often in, in sessions is when somebody's like, well, you know, says to the singer, like, well, what, what, you count it off. And the singer's like, <laughs> one, two, three, four. And then they just start playing like at halftime, you know? Yeah. So um, maybe, you know, what are some things that you've learned about just sort of really nailing the tempo of a song you're about to do and things to avoid for the band? I, I know you were tracking a lot of drums and bass first, um, but, you know, sometimes you're tracking with the whole group of musicians and you need to just keep that perfect, perfect pocket and groove as you start the song. Well, I mean, generally you know, you kind of ballpark a tempo and then you, you end up going up, you know, up or down one or two, depending on what it is. But there's just a thing that happens with musicians that you just kind of know, like if, if the song is too fast, um, a lot of times, you know, the drummer will feel like he's, he's sitting back on the time, but every, you know, everybody else is maybe trying to push it because maybe the guitar player wants it to be faster, but you, and then when it's too slow, uh, and but it, you can always tell if everybody's really pushing uh, their performances are really ahead of the beat that way. Um, you just kind of find this this balance. I mean, there's really no magic sauce to you know finding the tempo and getting it there. But once once it's there, you just kind of know because it's like everybody's taking a deep breath and they've just settled in, and the and the and the song is moving forward like a freight train. Right. But if you're about to do you know the keep or take, you you maybe don't want the uh, first 30 seconds of the take to be the band finding that tempo, right? You want to start out at the right tempo. Um, what yeah. are some things that would help us kick off this, you know, this, we're going for the take, this is the one, guys. What are some things that help us just start it beautifully? Man, it's it's getting everybody relaxed, you know? I always take a little, I, I always take a, a bit of a deep breath uh, as as the click is running and I'm about to count it in just so that I can make sure that you know, my entire torso is relaxed uh, because if I'm tense, then I'm going to, I'm going to rush the time. Um, but, you know, I, I, like you said too, having, having those longer counts, like the one, two, one, two. And a lot of times, especially with people that have played with me a lot, I won't count the three and four ever, as long as everybody's got the click in their ears, because there's something that happens after, after the drummer stops counting and, you let and you're just sort of following the click the click track and then everybody comes in on the downbeat of a section it's it's like a bit of a breath like it 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 lets it gives everybody two beats 
going in to sort of settle into the time themselves. Because if I happen to, you know, if I'm feeling a little rushed on my count in or whatever else, um, that can set off the first bar or two of the song where everybody's rushing and then kind of settles back. But I find that if you, if you give a longer count and give, give a little bit of space, you know, even just on the three, four, when everybody drops in most of the time, you're going to, you're going to land in the spot that you want to be in. And, and from there, you're kind of off to the races. Okay. Groovy. Yeah. That's, that's great. Great tips. Um, to click or not to click. That is the question. That is the um, question. <laughs> man, it, again, it's, it's dependent on what it is that you're after. I mean, mo all pop music for the most part nowadays, you just have to have it because, you know, the computer is doing a lot of the work, but, um, if I've got a, a rock band in here, that's got a really, that they're really great and the drummer's really solid and does some things. And a lot of times it just feels better if they're playing without the click, I may get them in locked at, you know, if I want to have it at a specific tempo and get them started, um, you know, I'll let them count in and kind of get partway through a verse. And then I'll just kill it and let them go. And that, especially for, you know, kind of not radio rock kind of stuff, but just more garagey kind of vibe stuff that they, it just, it feels better because there's that, that looseness is what gives it the, uh, the, the, um, legitimacy and what, what makes a rock band sound like a rock band. Yeah. You I know? find that, I mean, I hear the same thing. There's times where we, we go no click and I'm like, that's, you guys found the pocket without the click in there. And as soon as the clicks in there, you lost the pocket. And I think it's probably a combination of things. I think our brain is shifting over towards trying to stay with that click. And when there is no click, your brain shifts towards listening to the other musicians and the other parts and finding your spot within that combination. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes, you know, you can do, you can have the best of both worlds. Like sometimes I'll, I'll just kind of bury the click within my mix and my headphones a little bit so that I'm, I'm still conscious of it. And, and in the little breaks, you know, you can, you can really hear it, like say in a, you know, in a, in a diamond before the, the chorus or something, you'll hear that little four count or whatever it is just to keep you honest. But at the end of the day, I mean, you, you can, as a, as a session drummer, uh, you can find, you can find the best of both worlds and that, um, some guys, you, you know, you, you'll run the click railed in your ears cause it has to be just on, it has to be as on as it can be. But for something that, could be a little looser and would benefit from that sort of thing. You can you can keep people on a click, but allow them to swim around the time a little bit too, just by burying the, the click in your headphone mix. Yeah, and I feel like I should qualify that uh, that statement because I've heard that here in the studio in Nashville, which is burying the click. And it means two things. It means what you just said, which is get it down so low that you only hear it in those little breaks so that everybody knows how to come in together on the one again, since you can't keep time on the hi-hat and not everybody can see each other. Um, but it also is an expression sometimes used by drummers when the click is really loud in the mix and burying the click can can also mean I'm so locked in that I'm not even hearing it because of my kicks and snares are landing right on top of it, I think. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Cool, man. Um, what about programming as part of your production process? How useful do you find that to be? And um, I guess that's sort of circling back to the, you know, the drum triggers kind of concept. Um, I do very little programming um, because I'm, I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know how to use a lot of the, the software, if I'm being really honest. I don't, um, if I do do any programming, I, I, uh, I have a series of uh, pretty, pretty extensive sample library and I'll just fly in parts and audition parts and then fly them in and draw them on the grid and then copy paste and do those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, just because that comes from the earliest days of Fruity Loops when I was in high school and like, you know, I could, I thought I was going to try and be the next Trent Reznor and I thought, man, I can do this. But nice. honestly, you know, like I'll have an idea for things, but sometimes, you know, I'll just, I'll, instead of programming a loop, I'll make a loop or I will phone people to come in. Like a lot of the, to come in and work with things and we'll find other things to, to work with that. I, I like the idea of when I am working on projects where there is programming, like sometimes I have a very specific idea of what I want the, the samples that I'm using to sound like and what those types of things are going to be. But a lot of times, you know, I, I will go to other people and see what their interpretation is of what's going on. And you, you know, cause it's, 
the way people's rhythmic interpretation of things is 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 different. I mean, there's there's always a core idea there and a and a, and a core uh, um, uh, rhythmic pattern of whatever material that you're working on. But it's always interesting to have somebody else come in and sort of bring their uh, their thoughts and their ideas to that, and then that inspires me to you know work together. And and a lot of times that ends up that co- that collaboration in there ends up you end up finding something that's a lot cooler than maybe what I could do just sitting around by myself. Yeah, and that that includes bringing somebody in for programming, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, at Pentavert, all you got to do is walk down to the get coffee, and you're like, "Hey, dude, you want to come in and just play a beat real quick?" Pretty much. I will. I will knock on Adam's door all the time and go, "Hey, man, you want to do this?" And he goes, "Yep." And that's, that's cool. And he kills it. Um, drums, guitars, amps, keyboards. Do we need the real thing, or can we make great records using digital versions in our DAW? Yes, and yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, I mean, I will always err on the side of hanging a microphone um, in front of something real just because the one thing that the ones and zeros can't get is the air. It can get really damn close. And, uh, you know, UA has probably come the closest with that aux box that they have. If, if Have you used that? I have not yet, but I've I've seen it and people have talked about it. It looks really cool. I like the idea that you're playing guitar, you're getting most of the real tube amp, but you don't have to worry about cranking that up in a space and miking it properly because it's going to simulate the cabinet for you. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's it's pretty great. Bobby picked one up here about a month ago, and and I'm mad at how much I actually like it because um, I, I, I don't love uh, the amp modeling stuff, but for certain things it works. I mean, and it, and, and you can use it on more radio geared kind of material. Um, but I just love the ability to move a microphone around and, and, and capture the air in the right place on a guitar amp. I just, there, I don't think you'll ever be able to substitute that. I like playing guitar through a real guitar amp for sure. Yeah. Um, have you had a chance to use the line six helix? I have. Um, it's cool. It's, it's definitely cool. Um, and and it and all those things they do have their place, but I find the the higher gain you're using on guitars, like if you're doing like a heavy rock kind of thing and and whatever else, I think that you can, for for my ear, you can get away from you can get away with that a little more. But mm-hmm. you know, sort of your your uh, your more open Tom Petty world kind of guitar sounds, like those types of things. I just I've yet to, you know, whether it's a camper or the the Helix stuff or a, a lot of those things, like you just you can get the 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 minutia of those, of, or you can you can get the 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 tone kind of close, but it's the minutia of having a room mic behind the fifty seven that's on the cabinet or whatever that's going to be. That it just that depth of the tone just isn't quite there. It doesn't capture all of it quite yet. Yeah, but soon I'm, enough they will. I'm sure. I'm with you. I think. I think as you turn the distortion up a little bit to the expressive zone, it can feel. I, I discover where it feels a little funny quicker. But if you just crank it, then everything's just over the top, and it's great. I, I love using the digital stuff for um, create. For I feel like I like it for overdubs more because it like oh I can just add this flavor or color or melodic line using this sound. Um, but, but, you know, playing with a band in the studio, just there's not much substitute for just cranking up an amp in here. It is for real, you know? Yeah. And it, but it also really, um, like you, you notice it more in the mix. Like you can hear the ones and zeros stacking up when you're doing something. And because there's the, everything just, the more you layer it, the more kind of brittle it sounds. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't feel like guitars anymore. It's just, I mean, at that point you might as well have a really great, uh, guitar patch on a, on a keyboard or something like that and just do that. Cause you, you can, you can hear the, you can hear the thinness of it. There's not a, there's not that lushness and the thickness of it, which, you know, has become a, a part of modern contemporary music and pop music that you hear. And it's, it's always going to have its place now because I hear people, I hear people talk about like younger producers and stuff, talk about it all the time that like they, they reach for the digital stuff because they can't make, the real things sound 
the way the digital stuff sounds, and that's right. the way that their ear is attuned to it now. Of course, it's been around for a minute, the idea of um, guitars out of keyboards, right? Everybody dance now! <laughs> yeah, basically, right? <laughs> All right, good. I didn't, I was, in my brain, I hit that note, but then when it actually came out, I didn't hit the note. I was in a much lower key. No, you, key. you, you nailed it. You're good. <laughs> All right, good, man. Thanks. <laughs> Want to know how to record killer drums in your studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with examples from Nashville session drummers in a Grammy-winning studio. Want to know how to master your own music at home? Rockstars of Mastering will show you how with plugins in your DAW so that your music will sound awesome when you finish your mixes. And if you're looking for a step-by-step -step solution for a pro mix that won't take years to learn, Ultimate Mixing Masterclass with Craig Alvin will show you a proven method for creating Grammy winning quality mixes that you can apply in your home studio right now. Or if you just need to learn the fundamentals of a great mix, then register for my free course, Mix Master Bundle, to get great mixes using simple, free plugins. Get started now making your best record ever at recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy. Use the code ROCKSTAR to get 10% off any course in the academy for a limited time. All right, we are approaching the end quickly. So let me go to some of our closing questions here um, that I like to ask you, and we'll just kind of blast through them quick. Um, when okay. you started out in holding, and I'm excuse me, in holding, when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? Now, of course, you've been doing this for a long time. You played music before you started recording, but what do you think was holding you back, and how'd you get through it? Holding me back as far as uh, getting. I'm not sure I totally understand that question. Right? Well, it's it's up for interpretation. Well, I, I don't know that really anything. I mean, it's, aside from just a lack of having uh, teachers or anyone to to show me how to use this four track that I saved up my allowance to buy, mm -hmm. um, you know. But it definitely wasn't wasn't motivation. I was I was pretty bound and determined. But that was. I think just a lack of of having anybody in my small town that really knew what the hell they were doing. I mean, in the very early on, that was uh, that was it. And then, you know, once I got into a studio, it was a lot of that was when I started interning. A lot of that was uh, just fear of doing the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, how about anybody who's a real mentor or influence for you? Some of the best advice you received. Uh, a guy named Paul James. Um, he worked at Compass Point for a while and he's a Winnipeg boy and he let me uh, be the annoying kid and follow him around. Best thing that he ever told me was, because uh, I, I would be like, well, how do I make the guitar sound like this and how do I do whatever else? And I thought there was just like some magic formula that, that made drums sound good in a mix. And he just said, man, just turn knobs until it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it sounds really simple, but, you know, he really, uh, that really change things because it forced me to go in and like do stuff and just go take things to the extreme. Like I didn't, I remember the day that he showed me with an 1176, how you can make the room mics pump. And I mean, it, that just blew my fucking mind. I yeah. was like, you know, so that was, that was the thing. And, and that I, I, I carry that with me to this day. I, there are no rules, just turn knobs until it's right. Thank God for compression and drums. Yes. Limiting too. Um, how about a recording tip hack or secret sauce, something the rock stars could use on their next session in the studio? Man, move the microphone first. That's that's the biggest thing is instead of grabbing an EQ or a compressor or doing anything, like just make sure that whatever your source is, whatever instrument that is, that it sounds good. Uh, or that it just and good just means what's right for the song and what what you're doing. But you know, before you do anything, move the microphone. And that, that'll do all the work for you. How about a favorite hardware tool, something physical you like to have on sessions? Man, this Trident console I'm sitting in front of right now is, uh, if I could carry it with me everywhere that I go, I probably would. Gum and consoles, right? <laughs> I remember that, right? It wasn't Trident a gum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I don't know where I came up with that. Um, favorite software tool, something you're excited about now that uh, would be cool to check out? Uh, the Acoustica Ruby plugin uh, EQ. Uh, it's based on the on the Fern EQ, the DW Fern, the red-faced looking job. Yes. Oh, man. This EQ is out of control. It's... 
it's my favorite thing and it's it does all the the thing I love about it is it's it's really heavy handed, but it's also extremely subtle in the way that it works with the filtering on the high and low end of everything. It's it's beautiful. It's the perfect EQ in my in my eyes. Okay, so you, but that's also a bit of a number cruncher. So, are you using a more powerful computer, or do you have any tips for how to not get um, not get bogged down when you're trying to use power plugins like that? Uh, making sure that you've got all of your regions, uh, you know, go into the, uh, the audio files menu on the right in Pro Tools and making sure that you've got, uh, uh, all of the unused regions taken out. Cause those are, those eat up so much horsepower. Uh, that's right. Uh, they, they bog down a, a session so quickly. And I've found that, you know, when I get sent things and people don't do that before they send them, um, that. I'll start opening things up and my computer will freak out a little bit or it'll crash because it doesn't do it. And as soon as I go in and clean all that stuff out, it makes a world of difference. I forgot about that, actually. I totally forgot about that. I used to do that all the time and I haven't done that in a minute. And I think you're about to change my life. I'm going to go do it <laughs> tomorrow, today. Um, give us a resource or a tip for the business side of doing music professionally if we want to do this for more than just a hobby. Man, a uh, resource or a tip, huh? What worked for you? How come you're making a living at this? Man, just get going after it. I mean, the biggest tip that I can say, you know, I'm I'm here on a on a visa. Uh, I'm married to an American citizen, but I'm here on a work visa and the only thing that I'm legally allowed to do is work in music and I so I don't have a choice. That and helps, I, right? <laughs> Which helps. I mean, I I just I have to go and do it. Um, you know, but the biggest thing is is be respectful to people, but you know, there's there's a way to uh, to to hustle and find work, um, but just don't be annoying and piss people off in doing so. But there's the that's the biggest thing is that there's lots of work out there, and it's just finding your uh, finding your way through it can be a bit of a of a nightmare sometimes. But don't be afraid to you know shit. Just do things for free. Show, put yourself out there, show people what you can do. And sometimes that means that you're not going to get paid for stuff. Yeah. Um, like that first record you said, you just, just let me redo all the drums for you. Yeah. I did that for two years as as much as I could. It was just like, you're doing a thing great. Oh, we don't know how much money have you got? Well, I got to do four songs and it's a hundred bucks. Great. What time do you need me there? Yeah. You know, I'm in all the time and just doing that. Cause one, you're always going to learn something and you're going to, you might go in and you might fail and, and this person might never call you again because you went in and shit the bed really hard or you might do a great job and you found a new person that you start a relationship with that you're going to be working with all the time. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, uh, how about staying organized? How do you keep your shit together? You got any tips for us? Yeah, um, file management is key. Uh, just making sure that when you're you know, working on a mix or whatever else, just making sure that you're saving along and naming saves for things. Um, when you're doing mix revisions, it's super important to go in and make sure you save as as the next thing so that you're not undoing, uh, you know, the, the first mix. Because quite often, you know, you get three or four revisions into a project and then they go back and they say, and this is a lesson that I've learned many, many, many times is, is well, I really like that first mix. But I, you know, I, when I opened it to do the revision, I didn't save it as, as mix two. And then I can't, I don't remember what it was or how it was and even how to get back to it. And then you look like a, an idiot because you don't know how to keep your shit organized. And uh, that's so frustrating. That's never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, I still do it. I'll get in, I'll be working. It was like, shit, I've been at this for 10 minutes and I've hit save four times. It's like, uh, I know that, that's my, uh, that's my worst is even when I know that I'm supposed to do a save as and rename it, some, I, you always have to, it's one of the frustrating things is, I wish they gave you the option of doing a save as at open because you have to open the one before and then do a save as. And sometimes I'm moving quick and I start changing things before I save as. Um, and then I forget. I'm like, crap, did I hit save? You know, did I go over that old mix? The other thing is sometimes you have to open the old mix because you're not sure if you're about to make a new move yet. So you haven't hit save as yet, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I, for the I, I put notes up on on things that I need to remember to do, like little sticky notes, like you know, in giant letters, like save your things in the right way, and and just little reminder notes and things like that, because all of that is so part and parcel to what we do. Yeah. Um. And and it's so important to make sure that you've got all of your sessions and everything together. Um. And 
and in a, in a cohesive, organized way. Because, I mean, you know this as well as I do, that you can, you can get yourself in a real pile of shit real fast is if that stuff's not together. And then, you know, it's, it makes your life and your work difficult. Uh, so the post-it note is a great tip. And one of the places I find that useful is you, you did something, you, you're going to have a lunch break. And when you get back, you're like, you know, maybe you, maybe there was a progress bar going and you're like, we got to go get lunch. We'll just, we just need to remember to do this thing when we get back. Just write that, like you said, in, in Sharpie on a post-it note, stick it on the center of your computer screen or mm-hmm. on your keyboard. Cause when you sit down to work again, you'd be like, oh shit, that's right. I need to do that thing. Well, and I keep, I keep notebooks. Like what I do is, um, I, I keep notebooks or I have a notebook on the console at all times when I'm, when I'm mixing or especially when I'm tracking and I'm working with the band, like I am, I am an avid note taker and just, you know, you'll be doing a pass on a song and I'll go in and, and I will, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hear something, an idea for a little noise or something before a chorus. And I'll just write that down and do that. And it's that way you're never forgetting anything. And it's, and it's a really easy way to keep track of that stuff. Yeah, indeed. Um, and then here's one other tip. So if you are concerned that you're going to blast over an old mix by accident, one strategy is before you, rather than open the mix you just did, is actually drag copy that in the same folder if you're on a Mac, you know, doing this. And mm-hmm. then that'll make a copy of it and then open the copy of it and rename it or just rename the copy before you open it. So that's a that's a preemptive way to do a save as. And um, the other is, you can also go to that Pro Tools session in the Finder folder, select it, and then pull up Do Get Info, and then there's a little lock button, and you can lock that file, and then it will never let you save over it again. Oh, so that's a little Mac trick that can help you not destroy shit. Look but at it, the big brain on Lidge. But it that. takes a couple extra steps, so I don't always do that. Um, all right, those. all right, and- groovy. Groovy, man. Great stuff, dude. Uh, here's our closing question for you. Okay. This one's hypothetical. You're going to go back in time, and we can take the Wayback Studio machine. You go rewinding back. You find Jay jamming with that dude in, um, you know, playing Sweet Leaf or whatever <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the music store. And you say, listen, man, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Before you drop your credit card on that four track or whatever, um, yep. you say here's the most single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day. What, what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Well, I would have told myself to get out of my, my small town sooner, um, and gone somewhere else. But the biggest thing would just be, um, shit. and you're, and you're like, and I'm not talking about going to the super Walmart in the next town over. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, honestly, it would have been, to, to get out and uh, explore uh, moving to a bigger center like Nashville or LA or New York to pursue this sooner than I did. Um, yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't leave Winnipeg until I was 33 and I, and uh, I wished, I mean, it's, it's cart before the horse kind of thing, but I, I learned so much in Winnipeg because there's, it's such an incredible music town and there's so many unbelievably gifted musicians, engineers, producers everything that you that i i don't know that i would have been ready just yet but I, I'm, i've always thought about when i look back on it what it would have been like if i'd actually tried to go to mi when i was 19 instead of moving to winnipeg and gone to la and seen what that would have looked like uh, am i the musicians institute yes right on well you know one of the things that you did do which i i feel like i'm picking up on is you, you were in a town where you had the opportunity to play your ass off with a lot of people and do the live shows and and be a player so that mm-hmm. when you did show up to a town like Nashville, you had chops to offer to people to play on things for free. Whereas if you're trying to do that in a, a town like Nashville, I feel like this could be a challenging place to sort of find beginners and start a band and, you know, you know, get get off the ground in that way. Yeah, you're you're entirely right. And you know, when it, I, I tell Winnipeg people that Winnipeg is if you took Austin and Nashville and like put it in a blender, you get you get the the level of musicianship that you get here. Um, but you get all that quirky weirdo creativeness and and yeah. like a real real arts forward community that you get out of Austin. And it was it was great for that. And you know, it it shaped the who I am today in this business more than I could ever begin to explain. So 
That's cool, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for hanging with us on Recording Studio Rockstars. I look forward to coming over and uh, meeting you in person and seeing Studio B over there. I can't wait to be back at Pentaveret. Let the Rockstars know where they can find you online. Where would you like them to go? Check out more about you. What if they're you know, looking to produce their next hit record? How do they reach out to you? You can uh, you can reach me at jjay at pennyarcadesounds.com. Uh, Instagram, you can just search jtook, J-A-Y-T-O-O-K-E. Uh, it's at Jimmy of the Tooks. Um, those are usually the two best ways to get a hold of me. All right, groovy. Well, Jay, thanks so much, dude. What a pleasure to hang. Thanks, Lidge. Very nice to meet you. We'll see you around the studio, dude. Thanks for listening, Rockstars. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Carl Tatz Design, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plug-in purchase or use the coupon ROCKSTARS at jzmic.com for 20% off the pop filter for a limited time. And don't forget to learn how to get your monitoring just right at carltatsdesign.com slash mixroom dash mentor. And finally, use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. We'll include all these links in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.